Hi, everyone. I'm Kelly Pokies Burke, and this is the Career Slay Podcast. Imagine the impact we could have on society if everyone loved what they did. That's what Career Slay is all about. I'm interviewing people who love their jobs and asking them how they got there and what they've learned along the way. We're here to slay the fear in career. My next guest on the Career Slay podcast is Dr. Shad Hathaway. Dr. Shad Hathaway is the owner and CEO of Indian Creek Dental, a deaf-friendly practice in the DFW Metroplex. Dr. Hathaway attended the number one dental school in the nation, the University of Michigan. And after dental school, he completed a residency in advanced general dentistry. In 2017, Dr. Hathaway started his own practice, Indian Creek Dental, combining his passion for dentistry and his wife's passion for sign language interpretation. That same year, he became the president of a local nonprofit clinic, Dental Health for Arlington, and was awarded the 2017 Dallas County Dental Society New Dentist of the Year. So I know what you're thinking. I interviewed a dentist? But after knowing Shad as both a friend and my own dentist for several years, there are few people I've met who share not only his level of passion for his work, but also his unrelenting drive to provide the best possible care for his patients. Shad's story is also an inspiring one of overcoming hardships that I wasn't even aware of before this interview. So recline back in that exam chair, look at that cute kitten poster on the ceiling, and get ready for a great story. Welcome to Career Slay, Shad. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. I'm like very impressed with everything you guys are putting together. So thank you so much. (laughs) Thank you for being here. All right. So why don't we start from the beginning? Tell us your story. What were you like as a child? So the first thing that always tends to wow people is I am the ninth of 10 children. I'm thankful to be a bottom child, a child near the end, bottom child, yeah. uh, as opposed to the top child, because um, we have two different family groups and the bottom five was really raised by my uh, oldest sister. And she's like the family matriarch. She's the person that held everybody together. Wow. Born in California and my parents moved to Idaho when I was real young my quality of life growing up in Idaho was way better than anything I think we could have had in California because the cost of living in California is super high. Mm -hmm. We could go to public schools, not be worried about safety. And I felt like the quality of education that I could get is what I would make it. Were you a curious child? Very. I just grew up always asking why. And a lot of the reason I did that is because I saw all of my family members going through so many different roads of life. And I thought, Why are you doing that? One of the things that uh, I'm always blown away by is that I I don't have any like life altering injuries. My parents' house burnt down two times. What? Um, Yeah, Um, because all of my brothers are just like super rambunctious and like the whole thing burned down. Whole thing burned down. Yeah. One of my favorite stories from my mom growing up, um, she could never get a babysitter, and the reason was because my I mean, there's siblings were 10 kids. crazy. Yeah. They finally got a girl to agree to babysitting that was like cheap enough for them to afford. And she like shows up at the end of whatever it was she was doing. And the babysitter is actually tied to a tree. No. <laughs> and she said, my second oldest brother was just watering her. <laughs> She is screaming at the top of her lungs. How she got tied to this tree, I do not know. But the innocence that he was just watering her like it was nothing, I'll never forget. He was like, oh, hi, mom. Just watering this screaming girl. That's hilarious. So where did you go to college? College in my household wasn't super important. Nearly half of my siblings dropped out of high school. There was no expectation for me to go to college. Like my parents never directly said, like, what are you going to do after high school? Mm -hmm. I just kind of created that own path myself. I was like, I'm going to go to school. Because I've seen all of the heartaches that my brothers went through, Mm -hmm. and I didn't want to live the life that they were living. They could be very financially successful with what they were doing, but a lot of my brothers got into construction, and their bodies were just, like, ripped apart. But... I knew from a very early age that I wanted to be a dentist. And that's one of the reasons that I got so lucky is because so many of my friends, they didn't know what they wanted to do with their life. But for me, it was like, I'm going to be a dentist. And how I become a dentist, that's going to be 
the differing factor there. Like, am I going to work a lot so I could save up for college without getting into debt? Or am I just going to academically excel and make it work? And I ended up choosing the latter of that. How old were you when you decided that you wanted to be a dentist? I was 12 years old. So What? I know. My initial spark with wanting to become a dentist really came from a lot of the heartaches that all of my family members had with their teeth. Mm -hmm. And uh, I saw the issues that we all had going on. And I was, I was one of those people too. I'm a unique dentist because I have a filling on every single tooth in my mouth. So I've spent a lot of time in the dental chair. I went to an orthodontist to get this space maintainer because my teeth were collapsing in on themselves. And he had a parking spot that was right in front of the front door. Mm-hmm. He had the sweetest BMW. And immediately I was like, I'm going to have a nice car and I'm going to be an orthodontist. Oh my God. And when we got done with the visit, my mom was like, oh my God, that was so expensive. He didn't actually do anything. And like hindsight, when you don't know how complex the treatment is, you're like, you just think of it as time. And you're like, that was such a short visit, but there's a lot that goes into it. But I thought he is not actually working and he has a nice car. This is awesome. (laughs) This is what I want to do. And um, looking back on it now, like if I wanted to just have a nice car with a career, there's many more easy ways to do that than becoming a dentist. (laughs) Probably the hardest way to make money. (laughs) So you go to school, you go to college. Where did you go again? Idaho State University. Yeah. So I ended up going to a smaller university close to where my family was for money reasons. And with that in mind, I knew I wanted to do grad school. So my undergraduate degree was just a conduit to get to the school that I wanted to get into. So what did you study in undergrad? So uh, when I first started college, I was going to be majoring in biology. And after taking my first botany class, I thought, I can't do this. And I was lucky enough to be at a university that had a zoology degree. What? Zoology? (laughs) Zoology is the animal biology. It's the study of animals. Uh, It's basically a biology degree with no botany credits. And where did you go to grad school? Uh, I went to dental school at the University of Michigan. I actually had a scholarship to go to Creighton University in Omaha, Nebraska, but I had spent four years going to school in Pocatello, Idaho, which is... Really exciting college town. So exciting. (laughs) It was synergistic because there was nothing you could do except study. There was You couldn't get into trouble in a city this small. It was like a big blessing for me to not take the financial option I had to go to Creighton mm-hmm. because all of the resources that Michigan had to like form me into a dentist mm-hmm. uh, was everything that I needed. For those who don't know, how long does dental school take? Oh, that's right. So the f- fastest you can get through dental school is eight years. Um, eight? Eight years. Yeah. Oh my I know. God. I thought it was two like a lawyer. Well, four years, four years undergrad, four okay. years grad school. Okay. So then after dental school, then you do a residency. Yep. Well, and how long is that? So my residency was 12 months, but a residency for dental school is not necessary. Okay. The reason I did a residency is because the dental curriculum has been four years for ever. And the amount of materials that we're learning about that we can use on patients, it takes a lot of time to kind of perfect those. Mm -hmm. The reins that are are put on you when you're in a residency is you can think like a doctor, but you have very, very strict oversight. It's interesting in dentistry, the bottom of the class is still a dentist. And usually the people that are at the top, they go and specialize into things. And when you specialize, you kind of limit your scope of practice, meaning you're choosing not to do other things. Mm -hmm. But as a general dentist, you could do everything. My personal view is you should be at the top of your class to be a general dentist. So what did you do after completing dental school in your residency? So immediately after... Uh, my residency, I started a job in Ohio. I was going to be working just for a corporate company. And this is the dumbest thing that I ever did. I was working seven days a week what? because I thought, if you do what you love, you'll never work a day in your life, which is terrible. Malarkey. <laughs> uh, I hated it. Every, every minute of my day after working a whole month without taking a single day off. But I got this huge blessing in disguise because the office I was working at exploded. It blew up, literally blew up. What? I know. I'll show you a picture later on. But the owner of the place said he wasn't going to start it back up. So he said, if you want to be out of your contract, we're done. I thought, 
this is a perfect opportunity for me to leave and get closer to my family. So I took two months off and I moved from Ohio to Texas and uh, it was the best move that I ever made. You became a master in the Academy of General Dentistry. Tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah. So when you get your license to practice, that's all it is. It's just a license to practice. And there are a lot of questions that are unanswered. Being that person that just has that why inherently built into me, when there are problems that come through the practice, I want to have an absolute answer to it. So I started taking a lot of continuing education after I graduated. And after taking class after class after class, I, I came to a lot of answers where I was like, oh my goodness, I don't understand how dentists can practice without taking the amount of education that I've taken because dentistry is so dynamic and it's constantly changing. It's very exciting. And to stay up on all, all that is like another full-time job. Why is it important to infuse, you know, this level of passion into your career? When I'm studying dentistry, when I'm doing stuff that's outside of patient care, I don't view it as work, even though it very much is. And the only thing that motivates me to, to stay awake and do that is wanting to be the best at what I'm doing. That's so, amazing. Yeah. So tell us a little bit more about Indian Creek Dental. Indian Creek Dental is my private practice that I started in 2017. I work for nine different dental offices before I settled on like the only way I'm going to make this work is by starting my own business. Mm -hmm. um, I needed to be able to make clinical decisions and financial decisions with the business that were devoid of outside influence. I was working with so many dentists that they were doing good work, but they could be doing better, but they didn't want to. Mm -hmm. I'm like, hey, you can do it this way. They're like, yeah, but you can make more money doing this. And in my head, I'm like nails on a chalkboard. Like if mm -hmm. you can do something better, do it better. Don't worry about the money in this situation. Just make it work. Does dental school prepare you for the private practice side of things for running a business. It doesn't seem like that's something that's no, in your curriculum, right? It doesn't. In dental school, you get no concept of what your overhead is. I have no idea how expensive something is until I do it a few times. Mm -hmm. And I'm perfectly accepting of losing money on doing a few procedures the first few times I do it because I'm learning from it. Where I give up on my own personal income, I pass on to my patients with quality. When I was younger, like going to the orthodontist, it was, oh my God, dentists make so much money. This is awesome. And then when I was in dental school, I didn't have to pay for anything. I was paying for it with my tuition, but mm -hmm. uh, all of the materials, disposables that I was using, I didn't think anything of it. And I was like, dentists get paid way too much for what they do. And then I became a dentist. I was like, we don't get paid enough for this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> the first couple of years of starting on my practice were scary. I did not take a single paycheck. And if that's not like an exercise in passion, I don't know what it is because I would get to work every day knowing I'm not going to make any money. I would keep doing the best work I possibly could. Wow. That's incredible. <laughs> yeah. And I internalized a lot of uh, my patient's financial woes and that like ripped me apart. But having two years of not making any money and knowing that I was giving them the best possible care and they couldn't be getting it done any better for any cheaper, it kind of reinforced my practice philosophy. I loved it. I don't think I could have done it any other way. Wow, that's really noble. So how does Indian Creek Dental stand out from other practices? We were lucky enough to be able to create our whole office from scratch, no outside influence, and I'm very passionate about what I'm doing. My wife is very passionate about what she's doing. She is a sign language interpreter and we are a deaf friendly practice. So everyone in the office, they learn about the deaf community and we do everything we can to accommodate. So I always have an interpreter with me whenever I have deaf clientele or okay. deaf patients and it just leads to a much better outcome to care. That's awesome. It's amazing. So tell me a little bit more about your community efforts, because that's another thing that differentiates you from other dentists. Yeah. So my nonprofit world got opened up in 2007 when I was an undergrad. 
always kept me keenly aware of a population of people that needed to be taken care of. Volunteered as much as I could throughout dental school and during my residency, mostly for like clinical experience. After that, I got to Texas and I didn't really know where to go. I didn't know what to do. I was just super down on the profession of dentistry and my volunteerism is what really helped bring me out of that, this like slump I was in because I was like, why am I a dentist? Because if you're doing something for just money, dentistry is not the place to do it because it's a, it's a hard profession. It is a brutal profession. And when I worked for this bigger company, my bosses would never talk to me about how good my quality of work was. They'd just be like, how much money did you make today? I got this opportunity to volunteer at a low income clinic and it like reinvigorated me. All they did was just extractions on low income individuals or homeless individuals. What's it called? Dental Health for Arlington. So I got involved with this nonprofit and real thankful for that. Should have been a little bit of a red flag because I was able to get on their executive board of directors after one year of volunteering. And then I became the president after two years of volunteering. There were a lot of obstacles that we had to get through. There were a lot of things that weren't happening with this place. And that's around the same time I started my own practice. And this is where it was like, looking back on it, I don't know how I did it. That's incredible. Yeah. And you actually won an award for... We did. So a lot of the community involvement that I took from my nonprofit, I kept it going with my own office. We're a small organization, so the amount we give back pales in comparison to some of the bigger companies, but the percentage of what we give back is much larger than, I think, any business around us. That's amazing. You had this stat, this incredible stat about dentists. Do you want to share that? This is actually something that just always kept me focused on giving back to the community. It was a public health paper I read somewhere in my first couple of years of college where it was like, if every dentist donated 10% of their time, now it's their time, not their money. um, We would not have any need for Medicaid or social services in the dental world. Donating your time as a dentist is very difficult because it's hard on your body. And it is very expensive to donate time for me to to do a procedure on someone. I still have my disposables. So getting a dentist motivated to donate their time is very difficult. So is there a particular challenge, either personal or professional, that you've had to overcome that's given you some clarity on the way you approach work? Yeah, so I'm dyslexic, and I'm dyslexic in a way where I have to read through things very, very slowly, and I have to do it many times over before I understand the concept. Around how old were you when you discovered that you had dyslexia? It was college. So yeah, growing up, I always knew that it just took me longer to get through reading things. One of my best friends was a very fast reader and we would like read on the bus together and he'd like get through a book in like four bus rides. And I would be like still on the same book and be like, what's taking you so long to get through it? And I didn't realize at the time that As I read through things, everything gets flipped, but I didn't think anything of it. And then when I got to college, when your time is really important on how quickly you can get through something, I was taking three and four times the repetition to get through the same information where they, they actually put me with a counselor and they're like, did you know that you're dyslexic? And I'm like, everything makes so much more sense right now. Wow. So repetition is something that calms me down because I, I've had a lot of mistakes uh-huh. from just how I interpret information. The Checklist Manifesto is a book that I read that was like spoke to me in ways that no book has ever spoke to me because it reinforced the importance of redundancy. And sometimes people think it's trivial, but for me, it's just what I need to get the bare minimum. So That's fascinating. No, I, I don't think it's... Uh, It's something that I got through, but I wouldn't say it's something that stopped me from doing everything I wanted to do. So looking back, we ask this to every person on the podcast, what advice would you give your 20-year-old self? It would have to be slow down. So I grew up with a lot of financial instability, and I felt that the only thing that I could do to be successful was get to my position as fast as I possibly could. If I wasn't worried about money early on, I would have taken a, a whole year of not, not focusing on education. And many dentists that I talked to before I actually got into dental school, they said, take a year off, don't do anything, just be yourself. 
And I thought, oh, that's so great, but you're a dentist and you're rich. <laughs> you, can, you could say that. And I would have definitely given myself more time to not be focused on education. Yeah. I have a sister who is a doctor, and I know that she went from one thing to the next thing, yeah. and it was nonstop for the eight plus years. And then by that time, you're like ready to settle down, have a family. And so, yeah, I can completely understand the how you would want to just take some time for yourself and figure out who you are and what you want in your life. Yeah. This is where I was lucky because I always knew I wanted to be a dentist. And around the time when I was applying for dental schools, there was a very real possibility that I wouldn't get into dental school. And I was thinking, am I going to be uh, someone that applies a second time to dental school, a third time to dental school? Uh, or am I going to be someone that completely pivots and goes into a new profession? And I was considering doing a PhD program in uh, organic chemistry uh, because I was very good at organic chemistry. It was something that just worked very well for me. That's I don't. I've never heard anyone who was like, "I'm great at organic chemistry." Yeah. That's like every pre med, you know, person's nightmare. It's um, one of the only classes in college that I got a ninety nine percent in. Like, did I never missed a point on an exam? So that's crazy. <laughs> I was considering it because I was thinking about failure. I wasn't going to be doing these professions because it was something that I, I wanted to do. I was going to be doing it because I failed at something. And um, I think I was so stubborn that I thought, if I don't get accepted this first round of going through, then everything is ruined. It's not meant to be. I don't want to do it. But deep down, I, I wonder what life would have been like if I, if I did fail that first time. And then I would have had to apply again. I don't know if I would have done it. I mean, I think just your story, you talk about how much resilience and perseverance and how you always want to be the best at what you do. So I, I have no doubt you would have done it again. Yeah, I'd like to think so, but I'm glad I didn't have to answer that question. <laughs> yeah. Every success I've ever needed in life, I got it at the appropriate time. And I love that. All right. So if you had to sum up your career in three words, what would that be? <sighs> I would have to say discipline. That's the first thing. Getting through all the education that I've gone through, there's a lot of things that you do not like to do, but um, you have to do it. And the discipline to do something as best that you can do it, even though you don't like the actual work, that goes a long way. So discipline is definitely the first thing. The second word has to be integrity because... I know that I'm out there trying to be the best version of myself for everybody that I'm taking care of. And whether they perceive me as being good at it or not good at it isn't my problem. So just being true to myself and knowing like I'm a good guy, I'm an honest guy, I'm taking care of people as best as they can be taken care of. That's something that took me a long time to kind of get over. So the integrity of like who I am on the outside and out, who I am on the inside, sometimes there's a break there. And that's hard. And then three words, process. So I'm going to go with discipline, integrity, and process. So it's not the end result that really matters while you're going through life. It's that whole process of how you're getting there. And you have to enjoy that process. Wow, that's incredible. You know, I really um, honor the fact that you have put discipline and process at the core of your career, especially when we started this conversation, you talked about how chaotic it was being one of 10 yes, children. So um, for you to find your own path and carve out your own path and realize your dream at such a young age, that's incredible. Very yeah. proud of you. It's been a lot of fun and I'm so thankful where I am today. Well, I think you set such a great example of how to get involved and be a staple of the community. And it's just really awesome to see how you're fusing purpose with your passion yeah, and how all those things are coming together to really make a difference in the world. So thank you, Shad, yeah, Dr. Shad. <laughs> thank you. You can call me Shad. Okay. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. I am so impressed with everything you guys have put together. This is amazing. <laughs> thank you so much. The Career Slay podcast is a co-production of Career Slay and Wild Reply, produced by Michael Burke. Stay tuned for some great conversations on slaying the fear in career. Mm -hmm.